At this year's Biophysical Society annual meeting, members from around the world gather here in San Francisco to network and connect and exchange the latest thinking about how the molecules of life are made, how different parts of a cell move and function, how complex systems in our bodies work, and much more. Since the 1950s, BPS members from scientific backgrounds including math, chemistry, physics, engineering, pharmacology, and material sciences have used their skills to explore and develop new tools for understanding how life works. And we're here to cover it all. This is Biophysical Society TV. Welcome back to the third and final episode of Biophysical TV. We hope you've all enjoyed the great sessions, networking, and activities that the Society has put together here in San Francisco. We round out our final episode with a quick tour of the exhibition hall and speak with a few of our innovative exhibitors. We're also joined in the studio by Lucy Delamotte, who discusses how her team is using modeling to understand the cellular membrane. Incoming President Gail Robertson on the goals for her upcoming tenure. And visit more great institutions and research groups working on fascinating topics such as eukaryotic cell structure and understanding how animals sense odors. But first, we hear from the chair of the Biophysical Society Membership Committee, Melanie Coco. My name is Melanie Coco and I'm a faculty member at UC Irvine and I am also the chair of the membership committee for the Biophysical Society. I am thrilled to welcome the new members uh, to the Biophysical Society. Many of our members are lifetime members and they um, enjoy both the annual meeting and publishing in the journals and networking with other biophysicists. We piloted a new program this year uh, to match people who are interested in mentoring with new members. And um, so before the meeting, people can submit a questionnaire indicating their areas of interest or what they want to work on. This year we had 70 people sign up to be mentors and we, and we were able to pair them um, with people that they normally wouldn't have met because these are not people that are in their geographic circle. So the membership committee also sponsors a graduate fair, which is an online experience where undergraduates can log in and in one site they can see all the information for the various programs that are in biophysics. So one-stop shop, they can get links to apply to graduate school in that one place. Um, we also, at our annual meeting in February, we um, sponsor a career fair that includes the members from the graduate programs and also from various industries. We're all excited to be back in person uh, at the meeting in San Francisco. We're looking forward to San Diego's meeting and reconnecting with, um, with friends and people we've worked with before. The olfactory sense doesn't always garner as much attention as our sense of sight or even hearing, but the COVID-19 virus triggered all of us to pay attention to our sense of smell, as many who contracted the disease temporarily lost their olfactory sense. This next story features an esteemed group that's trying to understand a fundamental problem in neuroscience, how brains organize and process information from odors that then lead to behavioral actions. The Odor to Action Network is trying to solve really a fundamental problem in neuroscience, which is how do animals take odor stimulus from the environment around them and use that information in their brains to make behavioral decisions. A project of this scale really requires bringing together people with different areas of expertise, different interests, um, and, and that's a fundamental part of team science. Order to Action is a, is a big network of 16 PIs across the globe, right, in Canada and in the US, of course, and uh, in the UK. And the goal is that if we do team science well, that we hope to transform the state of knowledge on this problem in a way that's greater than what we could do individually as individual scientists. Trying to understand how the brain does this really complicated task can give us a window into how we might engineer man-made systems 
um, that can do equivalent tasks. That's one of the areas that uh, we're really excited about. And here we are now in the exhibit hall of San Francisco's Moscone Center, about to speak with a few of our innovators. AT BioQuest is definitely known for our calcium probes. That was our initial claim to fame, although we've heavily expanded what we can do and what we can offer. We focus very heavily on what may sound really odd, but robustness. How tough can these things, can these things stand up to the rigors of not only picture perfect, protocols, but the rigors that happen at the bench. Can they adapt to cell lines, to different types of, again, even just variances of buffer? And we're very proud of the fact that these have been extensively tested. Insofar as the calcium probes that really light my fire on a personal level is probably going to be our classic Calbright 520, which is our expanded version and our improved version of the already improved Cal 520. That being said, we've been giving, been very excited about our red shifted probes as well, which is also in that same product family. We are at booth number 404 and we would love to see you. I'm Michael Schmid and I'm uh, one of the co-directors of the National Institutes of Health High Resolution Cryoelectron Microscopy Initiative at Stanford and SLAC, S2C2. We're one of three centers, uh, S2C2, that has three missions one of which is high resolution data collection for people with data ready uh, samples for cryo -EM. Uh, training, which uh, we train people all the way from sample preparation to data collection and uh, help them with the data processing in their home institutions. And a new um, initiative that was uh, developed because of the the, the demand from the, from the community of screening, screening samples that aren't quite ready for high resolution data collection, but we can help them become ready for high resolution data collection. And this is free to the, to the community and, uh, and we're ready to help and help train anyone and help them with their data collection. We mostly are interested in people that have a problem that they'd like to solve and see that cryoEM is, is one way of solving that problem. We're at booth number 901, and uh, anyone from the three centers can be here to talk to you about getting training or, or uh, having data collection uh, capabilities for, for you. Chroma Technology is an optical filter company, and we've been here, been in business for 31 years. Uh, we've been coming to the Biophysical Society meeting for, I think, 31 years, which is great. This is one of our favorite shows. And then about 14 years ago, we started a company called 89 North, focusing on light sources for microscopy and distribution of microscopy equipment. So one of the reasons we like this show is this is really our market. We often talk about this being the, the tinkerer show, the people who want to do something a little above and beyond the norm. So our optical filters, our, our bread and butter is fluorescence microscopy. And I think one of the things that we can really offer this group is a, a fast prototyping. So this uh, talk that we're giving on Tuesday is called Objective Thinking, where we're, we're saying what, we've, what we're promoting here is an open source microscope. So, so if you have a, a cool idea about a new modality, but you need to get into the guts of that microscope, that's not as easy with some of the commercial microscopes. So here is very open, very malleable, very uh, open to personal customization. And so we want to enable that and that's just one of the examples of the things we're doing here. Electron microscopy is changing the way biologists study processes that occur on a cellular level. At the Laboratory of Cellular Imaging and Macromolecular Biophysics at the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, researchers are developing new techniques for studying eukaryotic cells. Let's see how. A current focus of our lab of cellular imaging and macromolecular biophysics is the application and development of electron microscopy techniques for determining the 3D ultrastructure of eukaryotic cells and tissues. One technique that we've been working with is serial block phase scanning electron microscopy, which consisted of an ultramicrotome built into a specimen chamber of an SEM. Images of a block phase are acquired by detecting the backscattered electron signal from heavy atom stained plastic embedded tissues and cells. We've applied serial block phase SEM 
to image beta cells of mouse pancreatic islets of Langerhans. By measuring the ratio of the volumes of the immature granule cores to the mature granule cores, it becomes feasible to determine the mass ratio of proinsulin to insulin. These results demonstrate that it is possible to build quantitative models of secretion pathways using the new generation of 3D EM techniques. We're here with Lucy Delamont from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. She's giving a talk on Tuesday entitled The Details of G-Protein Coupled Receptor Activation via Data-Driven Molecular Modeling. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Would you uh, mind talking briefly about some of the more recent exciting developments in structural biology that have allowed researchers to understand the cellular membrane in greater detail? So it, it's really interesting because um, in 2013 we had this so-called resolution revolution going on in cryo-electron microscopy and we went from having a, st a structure of a specific membrane protein to having structures of many of those. So now we can take an approach where we actually compare these different uh, membrane proteins and see how they work in relation to one another. So we used to think, you know, everything just like behaves like one protein, but in fact, with this resolution revolution, now we see that it's actually not the case and that different family members behave quite differently. And tell me what part computer modeling is playing in uh, better understanding this complex structure. Yeah, sure. So that's really interesting because my lab actually spe specializes in, um, in using so-called molecular dynamic simulations. Mm -hmm. So that's a technique that uses the methods from physics to model how the membrane protein is evolving over time. So instead of having like a structural snapshot like we have from experimental methods like cryo-electron microscopy, we end up with a movie of how the protein is, um, is, a, is working over time. And, and so we recycle methods from machine learning, artificial intelligence, and just adapting, adapt it to our needs. Please elaborate on some of the more exciting discoveries you've made. Yeah, so uh, what I'll be talking about, for example, in the, in the, in the talk tomorrow is uh, these G-protein couple receptors. The way they work is there's a ligand that comes from the outside of the cell. It binds to the receptor and that triggers a conformational change in the receptor that then has an effect downstream in the cell. And so we have realized that we can uh, sort of describe the protein in sort of a layered structure where the, 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 the layer that is influenced by ligand binding will then influence the layer that's right below, which in turn will influence the layer that's right below until we have this, um, this so-called allosteric change at the bottom of the receptor. So you can think of it as like a domino effect almost. But instead of being really like a domino where like one domino flips the next domino over, it's like a probabilistic domino effect. <laughs> and so Tell me just a little bit as well, it sounds like you work with quite a variety of um, fields. You were mentioning that you're borrowing from uh, artificial intelligence and other. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, yeah, that's interesting, actually. So I'm, I'm a chemist originally, mm. but um, I, I, I went to a university to study biology. I really liked biology. And then I realized I didn't like the way biology was taught. I really wanted to apply the methods from chemistry and physics that were more quantitative. and. I think it doesn't make sense anymore actually to divide science in like these Separate. disciplines because they actually kind of work together and why not use a method from a different field like why if if it's going to help your project I don't see why That's right yeah. bring everybody together. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well exactly. thank you so much for coming and talking with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. ISB is a multidisciplinary scientific community devoted to the understanding of biological complexity for biosociety development. Let's see how they're using systems biology to digitally test personalized therapies for multifactorial diseases. Periodically, sciences change their paradigms. It is a distinct set of concept theories, research methods to which the scientific community recognizes the ability to act as a basis for further research. Systems biology is a paradigm shifter in this sense in that it moves from a reductionistic analysis of living systems 
to a systemic approach, a systemic view, requiring a mathematical model and a dedicated experimentation to go hand in hand. ISBE is a multidisciplinary scientific community devoted to the understanding of biological complexity for biosociety developments. We mainly concentrate on metabolism that act as the integrator of genetic and environmental signals and in this way it acts as a driver of cellular fate from growing to death to differentiation. The final aim is to uncover biological laws and design and digitally test truly personalized therapies for multifactorial diseases including cancer and neurodegenerative disorders. The Biophysical Society annual meeting has been happening for a few days now and we wanted to check in with members to hear about what they found most inspiring about the meeting so far. Yeah, something that inspired me about BPS is meeting so many like-minded people. For example, this morning I was at this um, graduate uh, breakfast meeting which, um, well, I guess people of course come for the free coffee, but um, you meet like-minded people, you talk about your research, about other stuff, about grad school life. So. Um, it's been great, very inspiring. I found it really inspiring to see people who are just like a couple years older than me, like being able to present their research and um, on stage and um, being able to like take questions um, really comfortably um, since uh, I've never actually uh, presented in front of a lot of people before so I found it that very inspiring. You get to talk to some people who have a lot more experience than you and uh, get to know a little bit about the field, a little bit about um, you know biophysical society as a whole and you know being the first time coming here, I think it was a uh, you know, real eye-opener eye and um, it was uh, inspiring, I think. Oh, to be back and see people in person again is so wonderful. The exchange uh, is so much better in person. And now we'd like to welcome Gail Robertson, incoming president of the Biophysical Society. Welcome, Gail. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be here. Yes, it's our pleasure to have you. And what is it to you to have been selected as president? You know, I have been uh, a member of the society for many years, since probably as a trainee when I came to present my own work for the first time. I was excited. I was terrified. And I received a warm and supportive welcome and a lot of interest in my research at a very formative time in my career. And so this has been my intellectual home ever since. I've come back year after year with my own trainees and, um, and I've enjoyed many deep relationships with my colleagues over the years who, um, who support and challenge me in every way. And so, I want to do everything I can to promote and um, help the society thrive. And so it, I'm very grateful and honored to have the opportunity to um, work as president to support the society. That is wonderful. And how is it that you found yourself in biophysics? That's a good question as I went into college as an English major but I stumbled upon coursework that really piqued my interest initially with the kind of neuroscience that is really based in biophysics, Hodgkin and Huxley and, and the greats, uh, Bernard Katz, the greats of our, um, the history of biophysics. And so I, it just led me from one point to another through my PhD, my postdoc, which was in genetics, but always kind of building toward a point where I would become a biophysicist. And uh, what are you looking forward to as part of your tenure? Do you have any big goals and plans? Um, a, an important part of what I want to do is to um, continue the work of the Biophysical Society to promote um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I want to build upon the momentum of the Black Lives Matter, not let it just become a historical footnote. You know, 
Effective scientific societies lead cultural change, not react to it. So we want to be out in front supporting our trainees who are coming up in this space. And I, I just think this is a very exciting opportunity to um, reach to any groups of people who are feeling marginalized and bring them into the fold, provide them with that big biophysics welcome that I think we are known for. And so is that part of your background as well, mentorship? Yes, yeah. You know, when I started as an assistant professor decades ago, there was no formal training in how to be a good mentor. And so we really learned the hard way by the seat of our pants. And I'm afraid that wasn't always so easy for the mentees um, who helped me learn. But um, things are better now for junior faculty. There's formal mentor training. There's um, anti-bias training. Mm -hmm. And the, it's, it's a much better environment to be um, to learn the skills to be a good mentor. Where would you like to see the field of biophysics going in the future? Or where do you see the future of biophysics? Hmm. That's a tough question. I mean, because every year when I come to the meeting, you know, I'm like a kid in a candy store. There are so many new technologies that have been developed. There's so many conceptual advances every year. And I'm always thinking about how can I apply these to my own research. Um, so what I say, it, I think the future of, of biophysics is, is, pro is happening now. And so it happens so quickly. But uh, you can't underestimate the importance of new methodology to enable questions that you didn't even think to ask before those technologies were available. Well, it seems there is much to look forward to. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Sarah. It was my pleasure. And I'd just like to welcome the new membership of the Society to reach out to me anytime they have feedback or ideas of where they see a vision for the Society moving forward. Well, that's it for us here at Biophysical Society TV. Whether you are here to present your research or are a young scientist trying to find your niche, we hope you've had a chance to explore some of the fascinating advances in biophysics. And don't forget, you can watch Biophysical TV here in the Moscone Convention Center, in select hotels, and online. Thanks again for joining us and see you next time.